Dear ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I hope that all of you are doing well. I'm Dominic Platner, the ITTF High Performance Manager, and I'm very happy and proud to warmly welcome all of you to our 12th ITTF High Performance and Development webinar with the topic Mental Preparation in Table Tennis. I want to talk shortly about our webinar code, about our rules. To all the attendees, please mute yourself and turn off the video. Just the panelists, micro and webcam will be on. Please don't touch anything regarding the recording and our presentation slides. And please leave all your questions in the chat. We will try to answer as many as possible in the question and answer part of the webinar. Thank you very much. Over to the introduction of our today's panelists. I would like to warmly welcome our panelists today. They are real and great experts from the sport psychology field. I will start with Guillaume Matinot. He is the PhD from France. He is the associate professor in sports and exercise psychology at the University of Claude Bernard in Lyon. And he is the member of the Laboratory of, on Vulnerabilities and Innovation in Sport. Here you can also find his research gate page if you are interested to check it out. Hello, Guillaume. Furthermore, I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Christian Zepp from Germany. He is the expert in sport psychology of the German Table Tennis Association. Here you, below you can find his uh, personal homepage with further information and a virtual congress homepage regarding the topic of sports psychology if you are interested. Thank you very much, Christian and Guillaume, for taking the time. Last but not least, I warmly welcome our experienced ITDF high performance adult coach Massimo Costantini. Pass over to you, Max. Hello, hi everybody, and welcome our panelists. Great panelists, great expert. Uh, today we have a, a great opportunity, a golden opportunity for all our friends around the world. Uh, we have repeated many times uh, that uh, mental preparation is one of the pillar of the uh, performance of each player, from kids to the to the to the super super champions. So today we have the opportunity to to find more on this. And uh, I'm very happy to have this uh, this kind of webinar. It will be very very helpful. I'm sure with the expert we will get so many so many insight uh, opportunity to know more and make our knowledge uh, better and better. So thank you very much again, Guillaume and uh, Christian. Back to you, Dominique, and uh, look forward to your uh, things. Thank you very much, Massimo. Uh, as Massimo mentioned, uh, mental preparation in table tennis and in sports psychology in general are uh, topics of utmost importance. And nowadays, they are more and more addressed and touched in the public. Before we can dig a bit deeper into the mental preparation itself, we have to lightly touch a few topics prior. I would like to, to start with Christian. First of all, uh, what are the benefits of sports psychology in your opinion? Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation from my side. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today and to share um, something that I might know about sports psychology and about the field that I really love. So um, I really hope that I can deliver something to all attendees um, that might be beneficial there. Uh, regarding your question, Dominic, uh, what are the benefits of sports psychology? I think that's quite difficult to answer uh, because um, if we're uh, working in, um, uh, to, to improve our strength, we can measure today uh, that I'm pushing uh, 50 kilos uh, on the bench press and next week maybe it's 55 kilos. Um, in sports psychology, that it's, it's not that easy. So um, I think the benefits are especially on the subjective um, level of the athletes, of the coaches, of the teams. And if they feel better, if they have the impression that they can perform better, which then leads me to the three different areas of sports psychology. In sports psychology, or when people talk about sports psychology, 
they always think, well, we are there to improve the performance exclusively. Um, that's point one. Or, um, well, he must he must be crazy. He's seen the sport. He's seen the psychologist. He's he's talking to, to the sports psychologist. Uh, sports psychologist. He must be crazy. Um, unfortunately, we still see that. Um, nonetheless, we have three different areas that we try to work in when we work with athletes and coaches. And the first one, most obviously, is performance development. So help athletes develop the skills, the competencies that are necessary to perform well under pressure, for example. The next major, major part is um, personality development. Because we're not only working with the athlete who's sitting or standing in front of us, but also with the person behind that athlete. And I think that's very important. And the third area is then the aspect of mental health. Because if only if we are feeling well, if we're psychological healthy, then we're able to perform well and to lead a, a, a happy, successful life. And I think that's important to keep that in mind that we are trying to uh, work on those different areas uh, when we're working in sports psychology and thus try to create some benefits for the athletes or coaches. Thank you very much, Christian, for this uh, interesting uh, yeah, opinion. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, there can be, of course, uh, critical situations uh, throughout the career. Uh, we all do know that there can also be negative outcomes in a career too. Uh, the next question is uh, to you, Guillaume. Uh, could you give us a few examples and then we get closer to our topic, mental preparation in table tennis, and what to do to avoid those kind of situations. Hello, everybody. Thanks for the invitation. I am also uh, enthusiast to share with uh, the, uh, all the people about uh, sport psychology. Um, yes, in my uh, in my research and uh, on the on the field, I um, I work on the with uh, young athletes in intensive training centers, and we try to avoid uh, avoid um, negative outcome which could be problematic for the for the young athletes and for the uh, older athletes in fact um, and one of the characteristics of the high level uh, performance is that athletes and young athletes are um, have to face with uh, have to cope with high demands uh, psychological demand social demand and physical demands and it is problematic because in the everyday they have to uh, to uh, uh, to go to a high number of uh, training session and with physical demands uh, they have to complete in uh, an atmosphere of winning at all costs for someone and uh, they have also to um, to cope with uh, family distance and separation and all these demand can um, lead, can uh, develop negative outcomes like uh, burnout, for example, or control motivation, that is mal maladaptive motivation or maladaptive emotions. And it's really problematic because on the on their career, it is almost sure that uh, athletes will have to cope with difficult uh, difficult outcome, difficult situation, and they have to be, uh, they have to prepare this uh, situation to to be sure to um, to to go up and to continue uh, to invest uh, in the in the training and in the competition. And I think one of the most uh, benefits of mental preparation is. Uh, to cope with these maladaptive uh, outcomes. Uh, for example, uh, for sport burnouts, uh, in the next slide, um, uh, for example, sport burnout is characterized by three dimensions. Uh, the first is um, emotional and physical exhaustion. For example, an uh, athlete can, um, can say that they feel so tired from uh, their training that they have to trouble finding uh, energy uh, to do other things and it's problematic but what is important is that in athlete burnout uh, we have three dimensions simultaneously 
Therefore, the second dimension is related to uh, reduce accomplishment. I am not performing up to my ability in sports. It is important to note that it is um, a perception. It is not a reality. For example, some athletes and young athletes could perform well, but they can perceive that they not perform, perform up to their ability. And the third dimension is related to uh, sport devaluation and the stable tennis devaluation, devalorization. Uh, I don't care as much about my my table tennis performance as I used to. And this uh, this syndrome uh, of athlete burnout is really problematic because uh, generally, um, if athletes uh, experience athletes uh, if athletes experience athlete burnout, they will probably um, stop practicing table tennis at high level, uh, drop out and uh, they will lead also to low performance level. And um, mental preparation is here to uh, prevent this at the, the athletes to experience this, uh, this experience. And it is really important to uh, use uh, some mental preparation like, uh, um, for example, uh, we can use uh, some training program uh, targeting motivation or emotion uh, to prevent uh, this negative outcome. Um, an example with controlling motivation also, like uh, negative outcomes. Um, athletes um, invest uh, and practice table tennis for several reasons. And uh, using self-determination theory, we can identify uh, six dimensions of um, of motivation. Uh, these dimensions are uh, organized along a uh, self-determination uh, self continuum from a motivation, I don't know why I practice table tennis, to intrinsic motivation, I practice for the pleasure to play table tennis. But probably some athletes will practice for controlling form of motivation. Uh, in, the, in the slide, it refers to uh, external regulation or unprojected regulation. These two forms of, um, of motivation are, in, are a maladaptive form of motivation uh, because um, athletes practice not for the, for the good reason. Athletes practice for... Um, for, uh, for example, for, um, for, for uh, their coach, for their parents, or for wow. not seen uh, shame. Uh, and it's really a problem, I think, for the athletes, because you have to practice for pleasure and for being, um, for, for develop your, your competence in table tennis. And uh, to prevent athlete burnout or controlling motivation, it is possible to use a training session and mental training session. And I, uh, I think that the first sports psychologist, in fact, is the, is the coach. The coach is the one who can um, intervene uh, during training session on uh, motivation, on uh, emotion, uh, and other concepts in uh, in sport psychology, and I think it is really important to um, to share with athletes, with coach, um, for uh, help them uh, and for support them to uh, to prepare uh, to the competition and to pressure, for example. Uh, yes, uh, I don't remember the next slide, but I I think it yes, perfect. And thus, in conclusion, I think that uh, one of the most important thing is to um, yes to help coach uh, develop an adaptive environment for young athletes uh, using intervention, uh, for example, like uh, coach motivational climate, or I think. Uh, uh, also, um, developing uh, emotional intelligence uh, 
uh, among athletes, among young athletes or uh, among elite athletes, it's okay. Yes. Um, and one of the good practice is, is to regularly monitor uh, athletes uh, with um, a validated questionnaire, self-report questionnaire to identify and to, uh, to diagnostic uh, burnout, motivation and emotion in, uh, in the everyday of the training session. Uh, because it will be important to have information in order to identify when we have to intervene with the, with the coach and with the athletes. Um, yes, and I, I, uh, we, we can use uh, some, uh, some intervention. I, I talk about uh, motivation. It's possible to develop also uh, emotional competence. And for example, also uh, mindfulness is also useful for concentration. And uh, for sure, it is important to test the effectiveness of this program. And I think in the scientific literature, uh, we have know some information about, uh, about the usefulness of this program. And uh, we know how we can uh, develop useful um, intervention programs for helping athletes and coach uh, to optimize the content of the intervention program. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Guillaume, for your very interesting uh, approach uh, regarding um, yeah, this uh, negative outcomes in a career and and how how to be able to to avoid them thank you very much for this great example uh, and you've already uh, mentioned the topic uh, which is from utmost importance it's the motivation as you mentioned can be extrinsic or intrinsic and uh, now i would like to uh, talk with christian uh, about uh, the self-confidence which is also a very very important topic in, in uh, not just in sport, but in, in our daily life uh, in general. Um, it's also known as the mark of a champion. Uh, Christian, what are your thoughts regarding self-confidence and how would you prepare an athlete to be self-confident? So how to, how to grow, to grow self-confidence? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a very important topic. Uh, I think most athletes have experienced the situation that they thought, well, I, I have no self self confidence at all today. I have no idea how to play that match today. I have no idea about how to win that match today. Um, if we're talking about uh, self confidence, uh, the first thing that we have to keep in mind is that we have different sources that um, that create the self confidence. Um, the first source, for example, are uh, is um, personal accomplishments. So the remembering personal um, successes. Uh, when was I successful? When did I was I able to show my best performance in the past? Maybe uh, what was my personal moment of excellence? Maybe and that that directly is a method that we use when we're working with athletes to ask them, what was your moment of excellence? Um, when did you feel in the past really feel able to solve the situation, to win that match um, or to show your best performance, no matter if you won or lost? Because your performance is independent from the result, because maybe sometimes you're just playing a very, very good opponent on the other side or your opponent simply has the best day of her life and you're simply losing that match, although you showed your best performance in your life. And we have to accept that. So um, working together with athletes on the question of what are your personal successes? What are the skills that you have? Uh, what are your strengths in your game? Usually, and only very recently, I talked with one athlete and she said, you know, I always only focus on the weaknesses, on everything that I can't do during the match, on every mistake, on every failure that I just made. And that drains the self-confidence out of myself. And it's important to shift the focus then back again to 
What, what am I capable of? What are my skills? What are my competencies? Um, what are uh, my best shots maybe? What, what, are, what is the technique that I'm best in? And we have to work with that and, and that situation. And then there are three other sources, and those are vicarious experiences. So using um, someone else as a role model, for example, I see another player solving a difficult situation, and I learn if she can do it, then I can do it as well. If he did that, and I'm similar to that athlete, then I think that I can do it again myself. So we try to work with examples from other athletes. Um, another thing that helps, and that's maybe one job of the sports psychologist, but it's also from teammates and coaches, is that verbal persuasion helps. So hearing from someone that I believe in you, I think that's one of the most important sentences I can say to a person. I believe in you. I believe that you have the ability to win that game, to show your best performance. That also strengthens and um, enhances the self-confidence in athletes. And the last one that we can sometimes then use when working, when talking with the athletes is, um, you have that match right now. Imagine you, you showed your best performance. Maybe even you won that match. How will that feel? How will you feel after you won that match? And then we will have, have those athletes talk about those emotions that that are present um, while they think about that situation in the future and then we work with those emotions because we strive to have those emotions not only in our imagination in the future but in our real life because we want to achieve that situation so when we talk about self-confidence we try to work with those four sources and try to use those four sources to develop a higher um, self-confidence in athletes, maybe. Thank you very much for letting us know those four kind of uh, pillars of the self-confidence. And uh, you also mentioned that it's uh, very important uh, to, to put the focus on the, on the right thing, so to, to move your athlete on the right track, I would say. So the next uh, topic is uh, for Guillaume. Uh, Guillaume, uh, focus is of course very much uh, connected with concentration, the key, also known as the key to athletic excellence. Uh, what, what do you think, uh, how, how to, to build up a good uh, concentration or, or what, what should the athlete focus on? Yes, I think concentration is really uh, important for athletes and it is one of the most difficult uh, competence to develop for athletes and for young athletes. Uh, when I am in competition, it is difficult because I can uh, I can think about uh, several things and lots of things. And um, I think what is important is to uh, focus on the here and now. Don't think on the future. Don't think on the past. If I lose the previous point, it's not a problem. I have to concentrate, to focus on what I have to do for the next point and for now. And not uh, imagine the future, not focus on the past, but only keep on the present moments. Uh, it, is, uh, it is related to mindfulness and to accept and to uh, being in the present moment for uh, performing. And I think it is one of the most difficult um, competence to develop because uh, in competition um, it is really important and therefore we have so uh, many emotions and it is difficult to manage the emotions and one of the means to manage the emotion is to focus, is to focus on the here and now and focus on the play, uh, wh what I have to do, no, and not think on the future or, or on the past. Thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, it's so important to focus on the here and now. And uh, we all do know that, uh, for example, Christian, uh, self-talk uh, would be, of course, also 
also a technique to use uh, to focus on the here and now and to make yourself more aware of what to focus on. Uh, what, what do you think about, uh, what is your opinion about self-talk and, and how to use it? Um, I think I know and I'm pretty sure that everyone knows that there's self-talk going on all the time. Um, sometimes we're aware of that self-talk, sometimes we're not. Uh, but self-talk is always present. Um, uh, I'd like to um, build on what uh, Guillaume just said. It's um, always important to focus on the here and now, maybe with the self-talk that I have, so I can say to myself only here and now, maybe. Uh, what I usually try to develop together with athletes is um, that they ask themselves a question that really helps them to stay in the here and now. Um, I like um, I like to give a short example from a different sport um, because I use that in uh, with every athlete from all sports all the time, and that's from Michael Phelps. Uh, everyone knows Michael Phelps, and uh, he had the um, the sentence that he asked himself all the time. That's what's important now, and if you abbreviate that, um, it's win in English. And win in English is success. So the question, um, what's important now, focuses my attention on the present moment. It tells me what is important now, what is it that I have to do next in order to achieve my goal, to win that match maybe. So what's important now is one self-talk, one specific sentence that I always try to share with athletes or coaches, because also coaches can, can maybe benefit from the self-talk in that situation, to really stay in the present moment. If, um, if I'm in the future, if I'm in the past, I'm not ask, I can't ask myself what's important now, what is it that I have to do next? So self-talk is a very important tool that we can use. And again, there we could uh, focus on different perspectives, different areas of self-talk, motivational self-talk. Yes, you can do it. Um, shifting my attention away from the future here to the present moment, um, trying to solve a certain problem. How can I deal with the service of my opponent in that situation? Or then maybe uh, rationalize um, and go out of that situation that I'm in right now because um, Maybe if I can reduce the stress and the pressure that I'm perceiving in that situation right now by thinking about, well, um, it really isn't important if I win that match right now because uh, luckily I'm living in a safe country and my family feels well at the moment. That's more important to me and that might reduce the stress. It might. It doesn't necessarily have to. Obviously, we're shifting the attention completely away from the match. For some athletes, that works. Uh, for others, it really, it completely doesn't. But it depends on the functionality of the self-talk that I'm using. And self-talk is a very important tool in, in, that, uh, in that perspective. Thank you very, very much, Christian, uh, for explaining us the self-talk a little bit more in detail. And uh, I would say also self-talk is a, is a kind of routine of an athlete. So there can be a pre in the game and post game routines. Uh, Guillaume, um, so um, what, what kind of routines would you uh, suggest uh, to, to implement? Um, in fact, it is difficult to respond to this, to this question because routine is, uh, is uh, generally uh, really individualized. Therefore, one routine for one athlete perhaps could not be useful for another athlete. And I think what is important is to build, uh, to build the routine in collaboration with the athletes. Some athletes uh, will need to think about uh, a positive picture, uh, to, uh, to think about uh, past success, uh, for example, in their routine. Other athletes will need to, uh, to have a routine for uh, uh, avoid them to think about uh, future of our past and therefore uh, what is important is to build the routine in collaboration with the athletes and I think it is 
not possible to um, to improvise in competition. The routine should be developed in the training session and should be tested in the training session. It is not possible to improvise during competition because it is too stressful and too, too difficult. And I think it is the, the most important thing for the routine. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Uh, as you mentioned before, it's important to, to brief the routine. Yeah, uh, Christian, uh, I would uh, <laughs> go over to the next topic, uh, the psychological techniques, I would call it. Uh, let's start, for example, with the abdominal breathing or uh, what, what, which other kind of, uh, kind of techniques uh, would you recommend to our players? Mm -hmm. um... I think that's a very difficult question <laughs> because um, psychological skills training is so so broad and it's very difficult to say you have to practice that you have to develop that skill all obviously most of those skills really might help all athletes in different situations in training and competition um, uh, um, apart from the uh, abdominal breathing that you just mentioned, um, any breathing exercise that really helps me, and again, I'm, uh, I'm referring to something that Guillaume mentioned a couple of minutes ago, um, any breathing exercise that helps me to get my attention back to the present moment is helpful to be trained and be practiced and to be learned by athletes. And it really doesn't necessarily have to be abdominal um, breathing. It can be any breathing exercise. Um, I don't have a fixed dogma in, the, in that perspective as, as that I say, you have to do that and then you will develop this skill or another skill because that really depends on the, on the person, on the athlete um, that's sitting in front of me. What's working with that athlete might not be working with another athlete. Um, but if you ask me, um, what what technique which you think is beneficial for athletes i think it's um the classical mental training is the visualization of of movements of techniques of tactics um sitting at home um or being in bed or sitting in the in the airplane to my next competition and using that time to picture my technique, to picture myself standing at the table and playing uh, that technique, playing that tactics, that's really, really beneficial because that way I can maximize my practice time. Um, our physical body is limited. Uh, we, unfortunately, we lost. Uh... Christian, he is now again here. Yes, Hello, here Christian. I am again. Okay. Hello. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, so I just was away. I was um, oh, cancelled. Oh. Um, oh. So maybe you can uh, just sit on the airplane and maximize your, your playing time, your, your practice time, your training time. Um, your physical body has limits um, as to how many hours you can practice, but your mind well, your mind has limits as well, but um, when your body is, is tired, you can go on and practice for 15 more minutes. You can practice for one hour more if you wish. And that's the reason why I say visualization is so beneficial for, for athletes to learn. Thank you very much, Christian. And uh, thank you uh, for addressing the next uh, topic. <laughs> uh, the question is to Guillaume. Uh, it's uh, visualization, as Christian said, also known as imagery. Yeah, um, I know that you are also working a lot with analysis and so on. Um, of course, uh, visualization to cut videos to cut sequences takes time. But uh, what, what do you think are the are the let's say the advantages of of, of those techniques connected with the with the media? Yes, visualization, I think it is really important because um, uh, they can be, uh, this technique can be useful for several reasons. Uh, you can use uh, visualization for improving your technique and therefore you are on uh, technical uh, competence. 
but you can also use visual visualization for improving your uh, your psychological competence. Uh, for example, you can use um, motivational visualization or emotional visualization. You can anticipate a difficult situation uh, in visualization and uh, anticipate how you can behave in this uh, situation and therefore i think it is a, it is a really good strategy to prepare uh, the competition but what is important is to identify why you want to use the, visu the visualization because visualization imagery or uh, other techniques are all useful but what is important is to identify why you want to use this technique if you know that you want to use this technique for uh, improving your technical competence, you will use uh, a kind of visualization. If you want to prepare for uh, managing emotion during competition, you will also use imagination and uh, imagery, but uh, it is in fact uh, another technique that than imag ima imagination for improving uh, uh, technical competence, for example. Thank you very much, Guillaume. And uh, pass over to you, Christian, uh, with the next question. Uh, as uh, you and uh, Guillaume mentioned before, uh, visualization uh, can help you a lot. Uh, you know, also uh, visualizing maybe, let's say, you know, like uh, uncommon situations and also maybe negative situations before to prepare uh, well for those situations. So uh, regarding the anxiety management, uh, how would you set it up? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think those are two different aspects. So the one aspect is um, how do I prepare myself for difficult situations that might happen during during a competition? And I have to ha um, have a routine ready. I have a, I have to have a strategy ready as to how I want to deal with that situation then. Um, and I think that's uh, absolutely crucial, um, no matter on what level. What can go wrong, and how will, will I deal with the situation? Um, that's usually athletes do not like to think about that and to deal about what could go wrong. They usually say. Well, Chris, you know, I really do not want to deal with those difficult things. I want to focus on winning and all the positive outcomes. But if you only focus on the positive outcomes, you neglect um, the high probability that something can go wrong and most probably will go wrong. Um, and you have to prepare for that. So that's that's one part. And the other part is um, the anxiety management, uh, the stress management. And um, athletes... Um, have to develop, and we've touched on that before, have or should, could develop a certain routine that helps them get mentally ready for the, for the competition. Um, sometimes uh, we ask athletes to say, all right, how do you, how do you want to feel once the competition starts? Um, what is the arousal level that you wish that you have during the competition? Um, and then try to identify how to get there. Um, maybe that's the, the moment where we maybe can use the slide that we prepared um, for, for the question about anxiety or, or stress management, um, because I think that the, the diagram that we display there on the slide um, shows um, how we can explain how to reach our optimal performance level and deal with the pressures and the anxiety that might be present during that situation. So what you see here on that slide is a, a very basic um, inverted U function. Um, it's the jerks dodson law um, developed in the uh, early, very early 20th century. Um, but it still is applicable today. So on the left side, you see the level of your performance from zero to 100%, for example. And on the bottom, you see your arousal level from zero to 100%. Um, so the next step now, after uh, we've drawn the, uh, the chart, is to ask athletes, um, what do you think um, if you're 
zero percent aroused if there is no tension inside of your body how good can the performance be that you are able to show in that situation and usually they say zero percent um, or very 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 low now imagine that you're a hundred percent aroused so meaning there is um uh, you, you, the you can't be scared more Maybe that's um, you're, you're scared to death, literally. So a hundred percent aroused. How good would the performance then be once you uh, you would be standing at the table? And usually it's very very low, so zero to maybe ten percent. And then we usually ask the athletes, all right, but how much do you need to be aroused then between one and uh, between zero and one hundred percent? to show your best performance, to be to achieve the optimal performance level. And they usually say something around 40 to 60 percent. And that's the reason why we have those uh, two green um, lines, uh, dotted lines here in the diagram. And that um, level there um, at the top shows that's our optimal performance level. We need some type of arousal, but it doesn't have to be too, too low and it doesn't have to be too high. And once we have identified the optimal performance level and the athletes have that number in their mind and they say, right now I'm, I'm approaching the table, I'm going to my match, I'm over aroused, they can think about, all right, what can I do in order to um, deal with the stress and um, move a little bit more into my optimal performance level. And sometimes athletes go to their table and say, well, I'm too relaxed at the moment. I'm somewhere between zero and 40%. Now my, my question would be, how can you activate yourself? How can you push yourself a little bit more so that you go a little bit more to the right and reach your optimal performance level? So going back to your question about um, the anxiety management, that would be one approach um, or the pressure management, showing your best performances under pressure. That would be one approach that um, coaches and other sports psychologists most obviously can take and do take um, in order to help their athletes understand what is going on in my, in my body and in my mind. And that it's a total normal, a totally normal um, uh, situation and condition that they feel stressed, that they feel anxious. However, they have the ability to deal with that in order to regulate their emotions and activate themselves. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, Guillaume, um, as Christian mentioned, of course, uh, all these uh, factors are also connected uh, with the surroundings. You know, they can be the surroundings can be disturbed. You know, can be disturbing or can also be supporting surroundings. So uh, what do you think how an athlete should uh, handle handle with the surroundings around him or her? Uh, yes, I, I think uh, what is really important uh, during competition is to identify my uh, um, optimal uh, individual optimal zone of functioning. In fact, all the uh, athletes have uh, uh, an individual zone in which he will be particularly uh, performant and particularly competent. And uh, in, uh, um, in uh, some environment which could be uh, particularly difficult, it is important to know which zone is helpful for me. If I know uh, if I know uh, in which zone I, I should be during the competition, it is easier to prepare for the competition and to uh, learn how I can enter in my individual zone of functioning uh, for being uh, efficacious uh, during competition. And um, if, we, uh, if we can identify with the athletes uh, is individual zone of optimal functioning. It will be uh, really uh, easier to work uh, with this information uh, in the training session. If I know this information, therefore, I can um, uh, more easily uh, prepare uh, for, the, for the competition. 
Okay, thank you very much, Guillaume. Um, and Christian, and now it's time for the question and answer part. And I would like uh, to pass over to our uh, high performance edit coach, Massimo, with the first question. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting facts and, uh, and situation that uh, we as a player, <laughs> sometimes ago, player and, uh, and the coaches, uh, we, we, we find this so familiar, so many things very familiar. And, uh, and the, the, the situation you have described with some example are very useful. Um, I would say, especially for coaches, maybe we don't, we don't uh, um, consider enough uh, when, uh, when we are dealing with the players, you know, that uh, we coaches, we have to know a, a lot more than our, uh, than our uh, let's say, uh, knowledge, especially on the, on the psychological, uh, psychological areas. So uh, when when uh, we have uh, this uh, question from myself, for example, uh, when uh, when uh, we have to intervene uh, because the relationship between player and coach is very strong in table tennis, much more in uh, in uh, respect to other other competitions, other other sports. Sorry. So uh, um, what what we should do as a coaches to to get uh, to get uh, better better knowledge. Uh, to uh, to help uh, like players not so talkative um, is a, is a body language we have to learn is a, so what what do you suggest to our coaches uh, you know to get a little deeper and uh, understand better the player because we don't have to understand everything but we need to give answers to our players that's what they ask us when they are there in the match so what we should do starting from the professor guillaume and then uh, followed by by um, by christian yes uh, coach athlete relationship is uh, clearly uh, a big topic in sport psychology uh, and i think um, commitment is uh, really important uh, as a coach i have to know uh, the qualities of my athletes. I, I have to, to know how the athletes want I behave with him. It is a relationship, therefore, uh, we have to discuss uh, with the athletes and we have to exchange uh, deeper and deeper to understand and to create a particular relationship. I think uh, it is difficult to, um, to have uh, an ideal response in all the situation because the response will be individualized uh, with the athlete and with the coach because some coach are rather uh, communicative, other coach are rather directive and perhaps some athletes prefer uh, a directive uh, coach or a communicative coach. Therefore, it is a, an alchemy uh, a, a relationship to develop from the coach uh, to the athletes. Um, I think I, I'd like to build on that. Um, I think it's always important um, to consider the abilities of the coach. Um, so what are his or her preferred uh, communication styles? Um, at the same time, we have to consider the communication styles that the athlete athletes would prefer. Sometimes we already in that situation have have a, have a problem because those don't fit together. Um, and then there comes a third aspect. Maybe the situation in which we're in demands a certain communication style. And um, we have the question of the preferred communication style, the actual uh, communication style and the needed communication style. And, uh, and coaches have to be aware of that fact and always have to try to find the right way in uh, to, to um, find the right balance between the preferred and the actual and the needed um, communication style. And uh, something else I'd like to add on, uh, add to that is, um, I believe that one of the most important aspects for creating a trusting relationship um, between a coach and an athlete is that 
the coach is able to feel how the athlete feels. What is it that's happening inside the athlete right now? Um, to have empathy for the athlete, to be empathetic. I believe that this is important. And to uh, feel what, what emotions are present in the athlete and to verbalize these emotions then as well. And to talk with the athletes maybe about those emotions. Right now, I have the feeling that you're a little stressed. Is that correct? Or I, you don't seem to be very happy today. What, um, what's going on in your life? So that way, you're expressing interest in the person behind the athlete. It's not only the athlete that we're working with. It's always the person behind the athlete. And once we know the person behind the athlete, we're more able to connect and interact um, with the athlete. And I believe, I truly believe that this is very, very important to create a positive work and trusting uh, coach-athlete relationship. So uh, communication and uh, interactions and know each other, it's, uh, it's uh, super important I mean, for the coaches and uh, for the player to have the best uh, outcome from their, uh, their uh, relationships. So yeah, um, we have received some uh, questions prior to the webinar, some questions and also during the, the webinar. Um, I have one, uh, then um, Dominic, I will give back to you. It's uh, one very, <laughs> it happened very often to me that they asked me this. So now I have the expert from uh, Colombia, Juan Pablo Parra, uh, a very uh, regular situation, I would say. You are leading the match 3-0. But uh, uh, it's simple tennis, you know, uh, the match is now 3 all. Uh, is there any tip or something that the player could uh, could do at this moment to, you know, to get back uh, to the to the situation? You're going, you're leading 3-0, back 3 all. what to do? Uh, professor, again, you and then uh, Christian. <laughs> yes. I think it is um, it is related to what we talk about uh, when we talk about the here and now. If you think that you win 3-0 and now there is 3-3, it's difficult because you you know that the the, the 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 situation is perhaps difficult for you. No, therefore you have to uh, not think to the past and to focus only on what I have to do uh, in, for the next point which serve at which return, uh, which placement of the ball, etc. And you have to um, focus only on, the, uh, on these elements and not on the emotional uh, outcomes uh, from the fact that uh, you win 3-0 and know there is 3-3, I think. So, uh, uh, Christian, so we have to prepare the players also to, to have this kind of situation, basically. Yes, um, I think we have to uh, practice such situations uh, uh, even more during during the training uh, in order to be prepared for the situation during the match. Um, and uh, I, I believe it's very, uh, very difficult to answer uh, such a question. Uh, what do I do in order to come back uh, once I'm three sets behind? Because if we would have the right solution, um, well, we won't we won't have that situation uh, anymore in the future, or or we would be uh, magicians maybe uh, if we can, could solve those situations. Yes, we have to uh, practice those situations during training and bring athletes into the situation that they feel a lot of pressure, or maybe and that's also the case in such a situation, lose all the pressure because there's no pressure at all right now. Everyone expects me to lose because I'm I'm trailing by three sets and no one expects me that I'm coming back, back and win that match 4-3. Uh, no one expects me to do so. So there is no pressure. And usually in such situations, athletes afterwards say, well, I didn't have any pressure. I was just able to play freely. I just was able to focus on myself. 
I really didn't deal with what was going on on the other side of the table or outside the box or whatever it is that usually distracts me. I was just, I, I really didn't care. And I was just playing. And that way, athletes usually get back into the match and then maybe uh, uh, reach the seventh set then. Yeah, but then the situation is reversed for the other one. <laughs> that was exactly. <laughs> exactly. It was yes. me. Okay, I was very close to win, and then suddenly the situation is uh, is equal. So it's it's also a psychological battle. It's not only yeah. techniques, as we said. Uh, table tennis is a mental sport, and we now we know why. <laughs> Dominic, back to you. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, it's a prior webinar question, and I uh, would like to start this time uh, with uh, Dr. Zepp. Um, it's the question is from Lokesh Singh Bakri from India. Uh, we haven't addressed so far this topic, so it's kind of interesting, I would say. Uh, Christian, in in children, how how do we develop a mental preparation of table tennis before, during, and after a match? Um, all right, so that's very specific. Uh, I think um, the, one of the most important aspects that we have to consider is to start early with uh, sports psychological skills training um, and to get athletes uh, and smaller children um, in contact with sports psychology on, on a playful level. That, that doesn't mean it's a workshop, that doesn't mean it's it's a lecture, that doesn't mean that it's an individual session, but maybe um, uh, creating situations again where athletes uh, and those children maybe see, all right, all right, there is some stress maybe. How, how could I deal with that situation right now? Um, it is by learning from other athletes, so exchanging um, thoughts about and methods how do you deal with the situation um, what what is it that you do that's that's one approach that we take in germany um, that we uh, use uh, peer teaching so learning from others um, having them share their stress uh, stressful situations and having them also share their methods how they deal with uh, such situations so that would be one approach that you could take um, I think it's very it, it's not only important to practice sports psychological skills training in table tennis. I think it's important to get young children in contact with sports psychology independent from the sport um, to get a feeling what's happening there. Because as I mentioned in the very beginning, um, sports psychology is not only performance development, it's also personality development. And everything that we do in sports psychology will help the children also be better in school, maybe deal better with situations when there is an exam, for example. And I think that it's important that we uh, create a bigger picture for, for young children, especially, and then try to specialize and get a little bit closer in the approach that we take. Thank you very much, Christian. And uh, what about you, uh, Guillaume? What do you think? Yes, I think the approach of uh, Christian is really interesting. Um, the more you can start with uh, the athletes uh, which are young is better. In fact, if you start with young athletes, it is important and we, we will not talk about uh, mental preparation, but probably more about educational Uh, preparation or education, uh, mental education. And I think it is really important to um, to talk with other athletes, with coach, uh, how, can, uh, how can cope with this situation or with the other situation. Uh, if, if the athletes um, go to the high level athletes and never practice, practice uh, mental preparation, it will be difficult to start mental preparation with uh, uh, with athletes uh, with uh, 20 years old for example it is a good practice to start uh, when i were when the athletes uh, were young uh, because you can um, be uh, for example uh, more open to do, to this type of uh, 
of uh, session. And I think also another import important thing is not to um, separate uh, mental preparation from technical preparation, from tactical pre preparation. In fact, uh, in training session, we can uh, share these different competencies. Uh, during, um, during training session in the table, you can talk about motivation, you can talk about uh, uh, emotional management, and it is important to not disentangle uh, mental preparation with the preparation in the table. Thank you very much, uh, Guillaume and Christian, uh, for these interesting approaches. Uh, I would like to pass over to you, Max, for the next question. Yeah, one one more question, and then uh, time. Uh, wow, it's already <laughs> one hour. Uh, one more question I have from um, Rustemovsky, Raif Rustemovsky. Uh, we know that we, we during the tournament, especially the tournament, uh, we play from morning to, to sometimes to night. Uh, you know, it's not only international, but also domestic, uh, sometimes regional and so on, more local. So how to keep, uh, uh, how to keep up the motivation, focus, concentration, if you if you have to do this from morning to evening, maybe winning and losing, ups and downs. So how to manage this uh, very very uh, let's say uh, table tennis situation? You know because uh, there are not many other sports they do like us. Uh, one by one again uh, from uh, Guillaume first. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, for sure, it is difficult because if you have uh, to play uh, 10 matches in one day, it is very difficult to be uh, focused always on the, on the match. And uh, probably the key is to, um, is to be able to uh, avoid uh, thinking all the time to table tennis. Uh, when the match, the match is uh, finished, you have to think of other things and after for the next match you have to uh, focus on the match but not all the uh, all the time because it is not possible to focus uh, uh, all the time on uh, table tennis and therefore i think uh, the key is to uh, be focusing when you need to be focusing for the match but not all the time because it is impossible so find a way to set and reset uh, continuously. <laughs> Your, uh, it, it's like that, uh, uh, Christian. Yes, it's I think it's... There's many techniques that uh, we, can, uh, we can use, you know. Okay, I finished the, the, my match, now I have two hours break. Uh, and uh, what to do in that time? I mean, am I getting food or uh, enjoy even you have lost that match? I don't know, something like yeah. that. Yeah, I think it's important. Uh, we we stressed the um, the area of routines, developing routines, and to have a routine not only for the upcoming performance, but also a certain routine for after a performance. And if we um, walk around the um, the training halls uh, in international co um, competitions, we see some nations, some athletes really have such. Uh, post-performance routines, post-competition routines. They go there, they use their black roll, they stretch, uh, they're there, they, they um, try to uh, regulate their, their arousal after the match and then take the next steps in their routines. And I believe it's very important to have such post-competition routines. Um, and uh, one thing that might help them there is, uh, is um, or are different relaxation techniques, like meditation, for example. Uh, still, some athletes are very cautious of meditation. When you say meditation, everyone thinks of a Buddhist monk and I, uh, I have to sit there and do nothing and think nothing. Um, and it's absolutely not the case in that situation. And I think we have to educate more athletes and coaches in that direction that meditation is really beneficial for athletes. And regarding the question um, that you just read from the chat, I think it's also important uh, because it's not only referring to competitions, but also to training. 
how do I stay motivated in such situations? And I believe it's important, first of all, to have a clear goal for the first or maybe two clear goals for the first training session and a clear goal for the second training session. Otherwise, if I don't have a clear goal, I just go to practice because it's practice. And then if I just go to practice because today we practice, I can simply could also stay at home because then I won't achieve any goal that I might be pursuing with that uh, with that practice. That's the first thing. So I have a clear goal for that situation. And the other point is, how can I efficiently use the two hour break in between? And how can I relax in that situation in, in those two hours? How can I regenerate myself in those two hours? And I believe I, tr I, I truly believe that it's very, very important to regenerate there um, and to keep the right um, energy balance that you need to have. I mentioned in the very beginning that psychological health, mental health is also a huge domain of sports psychology. And we have to focus on the psychological health of athletes. And we have to try to find ways to help athletes to maintain a high energy, to maintain a high level of psychological health. Because if we have them inside the, the hall and practice for 10 or 11 hours a day and uh, there's no no way to to fool their their batteries. They will experience impaired mental health um, and then be likely, as uh, Guillaume mentioned in the very beginning, to drop to lose motivation in the first place, and eventually maybe drop out out of, out of the sport. Something that we definitely want to prevent. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, uh, Dominic, it's uh, it's again uh, to you, back to you. Thank you very much, Massimo. Uh, yeah, now all of us got aware that this, it is really difficult to measure sport psychology. It is more about the subjective point of view. There are three different areas uh, which should be covered. Performance development, it's about developing skills. Then the personality development, it's uh, the work with the person behind the athlete and the mental health, which is really very important to be able to perform well. Furthermore, we have to know that there are high demands on the athletes, uh, whether it's the physical, uh, it, they are the physical demands or the social demands or last but not least the psychological demands. And it is important to use mental preparation to avoid uh, those kind of burnouts, uh, prevent uh, the athletes from dropouts and, and of course also the low performance level. Uh, the coach is the first person to intervene, so be aware of your position as a coach. It is really very important to, to monitor your athletes and continuously. This is one of the most important things. Uh, remember your athlete on his her best performance on the moments of excellence, how, how Christian called it. Uh, and never forget that performance is independent from the result. Shift the focus of your athlete to, to his her strengths and competences and use the sentence, I believe in you more often as a coach when talking to your athletes. Uh, and uh, work a lot on the concentration because it is maybe the most difficult task to work on. Uh, but the focus on the here and now uh, is one of the most important things. So uh, also uh, one, one uh, option to, to focus on the here and now would be to use the self-talk as uh, both our experts emphasized. And uh, a great example is the win principle, uh, which uh, Michael Phelps uh, used to use. So uh, Christian and Guru emphasized the importance of visualization too. Notify why you want uh, to, to, to uh, know which technique. This is also very important. And the athletes should develop their individual certain routines to get mentally ready. Uh, and all that helps a lot to cope with the anxiety management. For you as a coach, it is important uh, to, to feel what the athlete present emotions are, talk about them. And last but not least, start early with a young age with sports psychology skill training. It is important to, to combine the mental preparation with the technical and tactical preparation. 
So have clear goals. Guillaume and Christian, we want to thank you very much for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and giving us so many interesting insights, advices, and for sharing your thoughts and experiences. So thank you very much, both of you. You're welcome. Thanks. And I would like to thank also all of you for the, to our attendees for your interest and attendance. And I'm looking forward to our next webinar. It will be on the next Wednesday at 4 p.m. Central European Summer Time with the topic career after sport. And we will have great panelists. Christina Todt, the former European champion, Werner Schlager, the singles world champion in 2003, former European champion and world number one. Jasna Rada, also known as Born Faslich. She was the European champion in women's and mixed doubles and the bronze medalist at the 1988 Olympic Games in the women's doubles. And last but not least, Jamie Perry from Australia. He was the Australian and Oceania champion. Looking forward to have a great discussion regarding their careers after sport. Will be great to get to know what they have done so far after having finished their active playing career. That's all from my side for today. Pass over to you, Max, and I kindly ask you for the closing words. Yeah, thank you very much. So many things uh, has been said today. So many things have been said today and uh, uh, not enough time, actually. So we will uh, may opt you for a future uh, discussion <laughs> because uh, we today we have learned so many things uh, and uh, I, I'm ho I hope that uh, all the attendees appreciated uh, your inputs uh, and your uh, tips. Uh, I believe that uh, this is an area so vast uh, that we, we really need to talk and talk more, to learn more and more. So uh, thank you very much again, uh, Guillaume and uh, Christian. Have a great day ahead and good luck for, uh, for your career and everything. And uh, next week uh, we have this interesting uh, webinar, uh, Career After Sport, with the great uh, panelists. So uh, see you next uh, Wednesday and thank you very much to all of you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.